Hello, I am the Dark Master, and welcome back to the History of Mississippi. In this period, we'll be discussing the formulative and woodland stages. formulative stage in a classification of North American chronology is often called the Neo-Indian period, or the Woodland period, after one of its more famous cultures. Regardless of its name, the formulative stage, classical stage, and post-classical stage are in North America, sometimes incorporated into the post-archaic period. I will not be doing that here, however. The topic of this video will be the, the stages of Woodland and formulative. And next time we'll discuss the Mississippian culture, which pretty much represents the classical and post-classical stages in the Southeast. The formative stage are the development of the woodland culture, for disclosure, just so that we can know this. The woodland term was introduced in the 1930s as a generic term for archaeological sites falling between archaic hunter-gatherers and Mississippian agriculturalists, and saw many important developments. The first of these development was the widespread use of and diversification of forms, decorations, and manufacturing practices of pottery. Now, if you watched my last video, you can tell that pottery manufacturing had arisen during the archaic stage in certain cultures, but this period saw it become commonplace. Despite their diversity, there were some general themes. Clay was often tempered with grit or limestone. Pots usually were made with conical jars with flaring rims, slightly constricted nets, and rounded shoulders. The pottery often was decorated with stamps that created a tooth-like impression. Others in included many wave-like impressions, checkered surfaces, and fabric impressions. Most of the designs were geometric, but rarely there were some pictorial images such as faces. Pots were often made by hand without pottery wheels and were sometimes painted with red ochre. With regards to their food sources, the Native Americans of the formulative and woodland period deployed a combination of farming and subsistence strategies. Subsistence gathering was especially prominent near the coastal regions such as Mississippi's southern coast. These areas alongside Salt marshes, rivers, and oceans were widely settled for maximum access to food resources. These wild food sources included plants and animals. Among plants that were gathered included nuts, such as hickory and acorns, berries, such as palm berries, blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries, and fruits, such as wild grapes and parsimians. In addition to these wild plants, there is evidence that the Amer Indians cultivated starchy seeds during this period. Wild game also provided a large food source for the Native Americans. Most cultures relied heavily on white-tailed deer, but other large mammals were eaten such as bears, beavers, and raccoons. Among aquatic animals, shellfish and androgynous fish, such as salmon which made regular migrations, were eaten as well. These resources changed with the seasons, and the various groups practiced seasonal mobility, which means that they moved in pursuit of specific food resources. This mobility plays into the third characteristic of these two stages, and that is the interaction that many of these cultures had. For instance, the Hope World culture, which emerged in the middle of the woodland stage, connected the Great Lakes and Southeast regions in trade or war. We'll be discussing this culture for the rest of the episode. The Hopewell tradition was named by Warren K. Moorhead, arguably one of the most influential archaeologists, having excavated more ancient earthen works than all his peers before and after. It was named after the Hopewell Mound Group in 
in Ross Country, Ohio, in 1891. For those curious, the Mound Group itself was named after the Hopewell family, who owned the mounds at the time. Keep in mind that the people probably did not call themselves Hopewellians. They were also more of a wide scattering of people rather than a united nation, as we would usually define it as such. The exact origins of the Hopewell culture are debated among modern archaeologists, but it is believed by some to have originated in western New York and migrated south into Ohio, where they built upon the local Adara mortuary tradition and inherited one of the first forms of North American politics and organized society. The Hopewell cultured a hierarchical society, with most people being cremated once they died, while important people like hunters and leaders received elaborate graves with status goods buried alongside them. These leaders were not kings, however, for they could not command armies of men. Instead, the Hopewell culture likely accorded certain families a special place, sometimes referred to as big men which can best be described as a precursor to chiefs, and acquire the position because they could pursue others to agree with them on matters such as religion, trade, and war. Whatever their true nature, this system increased social stability and reinforced sedentism. It also encouraged the specialized use of resources and population growth. They also used teamwork to build large mounds. These mounds have various geometric shapes, as well as animals, birds, and withering serpents. Just like the mound builders before them, these are some of their best surviving features. The mound's function is still under debate. Some scientists have demonstrated that the earthworks encode various sunrise and moonrise patterns, including solstices, the equinoxes, the cross-quarter days, the lunar minimum and maximum events. Many of the mounds also served as burials and included adornments made of obsidian, mica, and copper, as well as various artworks, which are some of the most famous of their artifacts. The Hopewell tradition created many artifacts. In addition to arrowheads, the standard, this tradition carved numerous intricate pipes for smoking. These pipes would often have animal effigies carved in them, with animals like ravens and otters represented in Hopewell sites. These pipes were made of catlinite. This material, alongside freshwater pearls, grizzly bear teeth, shark teeth, seashells, copper, and even a little silver, indicate a vast trade network. These minerals were employed by the Hopewell tradition to create some of the finest craft and artwork of North America. Mostly religious in nature, many of their graves are filled with ornate carvings, earplugs, pendants, and decorative ceremonial pottery. The art ranged from artwork so realistic that archaeologists could recognize the model was a chondroplastic dwarf to abstract art such as the mica hand, the copper spider, and the copper falcon. Perhaps one of the most disturbing of the various artworks is a mask created using a human skull. Indeed, it would appear that the Hopewells were disturbingly expert carvers of human bone. Truly noble indeed. Now, aside from the Ohio Hopewells, there were numerous other Middle Woodland period cultures that came from and were contemporary with the Hopewell tradition. Of these, four are known for Mississippi, the Marksville culture, the Copina culture, the Miller culture, and the Porter culture. The Marksville culture, culture covered the southern and western edges of Mississippi. Though they were mainly in Louisiana, they made pottery from local clay, and they are believed to have been ancestral to the historic Natchez and Tainisa people. They were contemporary, but not part of the Hopewell tradition, though indications such as their pottery indicate that they were likely at least partially influenced by them. The Miller culture was a Hopewellian culture 
unlike the Marksville culture. It is located in what is now northeastern Mississippi, and it is also known from Tennessee. Through three phases, these people built large mounds for feasting rituals that are fundamentally different from their successors, which used their mounds for mortuaries and substructure platforms. Sandwiched below them were the Capina culture, which is named after a combination of copper and galena, as these are often found in artifacts in their sites. Beneath it was the porter culture, of which little is known. The end of the woodland period alongside with this episode is marked with a decline of the Hopewell tradition. The population itself seems to have not decreased. Rather, they dispersed and split into smaller cultures. There are several possibilities of this, including climate, food, and trade which would all influence and lead to development of the successor culture, the Mississippian culture. Firstly, there was an extreme weather event of 535 to 536, which involved an extremely cool winter that would have harmed crops. This, combined with a general cooling weather, caused a decrease in the total food availability. Indeed, with regards to food, the crop variation between clans lessened as they developed, thereby weakening the need for trade. The population themselves might have even been at levels unsustainable with trade alone, so some clans resorted to raiding and war. Despite this rather somber ending, it could be said that there was no ending. For example, the Iroquois retained a life are technologically identical to late woodland periods until the arrival of the Europeans. And numerous other cultures did not abandon the spear for the bow and arrow like others did. Next time we'll be exploring the successor culture, which lasted until European contact, that is the Mississippian culture in the history of Mississippi.